to be able to get to know the rest of you as well. Um, my talk today is on public health genomics. So we're going to cover a, a range of topics today. Genetics is defined as the study of hereditary material, or DNA, that dictates the structure and function of living organisms. And I'll be showing you today how it's evolved from an observational science into a molecular one with growing clinical and public health applications. The history of human genetics goes way back to several thousand years ago to Babylonian clay tablets that documented about 60 different birth defects, some of which we still see today. About 2,000 years ago, the Talmud, which is Jewish scripture, documented the X-link transmission pattern um, that we recognize in hemophilia. In the 17th century, our microscopic approach to genetics got its root when Anton von Leeuwenhoek created the single lens microscope. He visualized bacteria and protozoa, and as well as uh, spermatozoa, the carrier of genetic information. In the 19th century, Joseph Adams wrote a treatise on the supposed hereditary properties of disease. He noticed that disorders run in families. He observed the negative consequences of inbreeding, and that's where the roots of family history and pedigree analysis came from. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. In the 19th century, Francis Galton studied quantitative traits, so uh, traits like height, uh, height, IQ, how heritable they are. He published um, her Hereditary Talent and Character, and from his work, we saw the beginnings of genetic epidemiology and quantitative genetics. By the 19th century, the famous Gre Gregor Mendel, also known as the father of genetics, who also has a striking resemblance to him. <laughs> <laughs> um, he did his famous pea plant studies and discovered basic laws of human heredity. In the 20th century, we saw the roots of newborn screening be born. He was the foundation, uh, he developed the foundation of metabolic genetics. He deduced that some hereditary diseases were caused by defects in enzymes and metabolism. The 20th century continued the boom in genetic discoveries. Hershey and Chase determined that DNA is the hereditary material. Ross and Frank Franklin's work led to Watson and Crick's discovery that the structure of the DNA molecule is a double helix. <coughs> a few years after that, we determined that the normal human body cell contains 46 chromosomes. And by the 1960s, we were able to use karyotypes, or chromosome spreads, for diagnostic purposes. Around that same period of time, we saw the beginnings of public health genomics um, emerging. So in the 1940s and 50s, genetic epidemiology research began appearing in the US and in Europe. State-mandated newborn screening programs were devised in the 1960s. Um, and we started to see the use of prenatal, prenatal genetic diagnosis for chromosomal anomalies. And then genomics and core public health concerns began to converge. In the 1970s, we saw an expansion in our ability to sequence genes. Walter Fears sequenced the first gene. Um, Max and Gilbert and Sanger expanded those DNA sequencing capabilities, and we became able to detect changes in the genetic code that were associated with disease. So how does a mutation cause disease? Basically, what genes do is they provide the instructions for protein construction in, in an organism. So if something goes wrong with that genetic code, if there's a mutation or an abnormal change in it that can alter protein production or or stop protein production, that's how disease ensues. We started to develop, um, we started to see uh, applications to environmental health that grew out of some, some laws on the books. For example, the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 and the Clean Air Act of 1970 um, caused officials to seek um, safety standards that would protect people um, from harm due to toxic environmental exposures. We're starting to look at gene environment interactions, toxicogenomics, nutrigenomics. So how does genotype pr predict your response to a toxic exposure, for example? So that you can see how that might have, have public health implications. By the 1990s, there was great interest in sequencing the entire human genome, and that's where the Human Genome Project began. 
Um, it was a joint effort by the Department of Energy and the NIH to sequence the entire genome, um, determine the number of genes in the human genome, determine their functions. Um, and the people who put together the Human Genome Project had a, a great deal of foresight in understanding that there would be a, a variety of ethical, legal, and so, uh, social implications um, of genetics research and understanding. So they had built in that LC mechanism um, to always monitor the effects of genetic information as it came up. Uh, sequencing was completed a lot faster than we expected in 2003 the whole genome was sequenced and it inspired more research into gene function and gene environment interactions. And so out of the Human Genome Project was born uh, additional genetic exploration. So right now we're involved in the International HAC Project, which is designed to uncover uh, common genetic variants that confer risk for certain diseases. So we're aiming that at discovering single, nuclei, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs for short, and copy number variations in the human genome that correlate with the disease. Um, <clears throat> one of the major study designs looking at genetic variants is the GWAS, the Genome-Wide Association Studies. And these seek to correlate the presence of particular gene markers or gene polymorphisms with the presence of disease. It helps us to narrow down which genes might be associated with certain diseases. And it has been, um, productive in some cases, we were able to determine a genetic variant that can predict risk for Alzheimer's disease, for example. The apolipoprotein E4 allele confers higher risk for this disease versus the apolipoprotein E2, which confers lower risk. But we're still learning about what associations might mean, how significant they are, um, if they can tell us about mechanisms behind disease processes. It's still a very um, early science. Another new realm of investigation is in the field of epigenetics. We're finding that it's not just um, the genetic code that is determining health risk or determining um, trait expression in individuals. We find that chemical changes in the DNA molecule external to that code um, and in structural proteins of DNA can also influence gene expression and disease predisposition. Can I, can we ask questions? Sure. I was gonna. Sure. Uh, so I, I, I keep getting different interpretations of what epigenetics mean. Okay. And I'm just reading the popular texts and things. So um, most of the literature that I've read imply that this is something uh, that happens. For example, a mother does eat some things while pregnant and somehow something acts on the DNA, uh, maybe related to methylation, or, or, and then you get a child who's different, then that can be passed on. Um, I think an example that I got was the uh, DES babies whose mothers were giving diethyl silverol, I guess, and then uh, subsequent generations were, passing, were, were susceptible to cancer, endometrial cancer. Okay. Um. But is it, could it also be related to things that are more social? For example, uh, when people talk about ADD and whether or not your mother was nice to you as a kid, okay. and then somehow that becomes, uh, I, that is while, while the baby is already a full-born person. Right. Uh, can you have something, which to me is very close to Lamarckism, and I'm right. just trying to right. <laughs> when, when I, right, exactly, yeah. because that's you know a trait that you acquire right. environmentally, and then that's passed on. It's exactly a Lamarckian idea. Um, and I think if I give you the next example, okay, well, I'll help explain. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. So um, they did a study, you know, just last year in 2010, on epigenetics and pregnancy, and they found that. Um, the offspring of women who are malnourished during pregnancy appear to have a higher risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes mellitus later in life. So it's thought to be um, due to a persistence of epigenetic changes that occurred in the baby's DNA that promoted its survival in utero. So something happened around the DNA, the mother was malnourished, you know, that's an environmental, you know, state, 
um, that made changes maybe on that thrifty gene, for example, that <coughs> is associated with diabetes, that stuck. So the, the, the DNA was primed to conserve, to conserve energy, to store fat, you know, and can, that persisted throughout life, creating um, a higher risk of obesity and diabetes. So that's a chemical change that occurred in utero, utero that stuck, that was not reversed, that continued to cause a risk for that patient. Um, in terms of behavioral changes, I can't imagine, honestly, you know, a mother being a certain way with a child causing a, a, an epigenetic change. I could imagine maybe more of a toxic exposure or a nutritional exposure, for example, that might have that chemical effect. Um, but maybe something the mother did during pregnancy might have caused an epigenetic change. Um, in terms of DES, we know that there's an increased risk of gynecologic cancers in, in babies who are exposed. Again, that might have been a chemical response in the And that goes on for more than just one generation. That's really it, does. Yeah. it does. It does. They've looked at um, studies of grandparents and how those genetic, um, epigenetic changes have, have transmitted multi-generational. Another large realm of research is going on in the area of microarrays. Um, comparative genomic hybridization is very much in vogue right now. What happens there is that we obtain an individual's DNA, we hybridize to a slide containing hundreds of thousands of defined DNA probes. We compare this hybridization pattern um, to a normal control sample, and this allows us to detect otherwise undetectable causes of chromosomal <coughs> disorders associated with duplications or deletions of gene genetic material. So you might have a complete absence of a gene, you might have multiple copies of the gene or a specific area of the gene, um, and that can affect phenotype. Um, the one limitation to that particular technology is it does not detect point mutations. Now, all the things that we're learning in the lab um, will ultimately have clinical implications. And making that connection between the laboratory science and, and the clinical applications is in the realm of translational research. I know some of you have an interest in that. Um, the role of genetics as a whole has expanded beyond the realm of obstetrics and pediatrics, which was basically the bread and butter of clinical genetics in the early days. But we're seeing genetics permeate more and more into virtually every medical specialty and aspect of healthcare. And public health implications are continuing to grow in parallel. So um, Dr. Moeen Khoury, who was the head of the CDC's Office of Public Health Genomics, which was actually recently disbanded, unfortunately, um, he's been very active in the area of translational research in genetics. And he put together a uh, a schematic of the stages of translational research and how to apply these genetic discoveries toward health promotion and disease prevention. So it, it, it parallels um, very much the same stages that uh, pharmaceutical companies go through in their drug development. It's developing a genetic test based on a genetic discovery. It's evaluating the test and creating guidelines for use. It's implementing that test in the healthcare system and measuring outcomes. Is that genetic test telling us what it's supposed to be telling us, and is it having an impact on health outcomes? Do you, do you have an example handy of something that's gone through all four stages? Um, I would probably say the BRCA testing and breast cancer uh, mutation analysis for cancer susceptibility. Mm -hmm. um, so the CDC uh, Office of Public Health Genomics has put together several um, initiatives to address translation of genetic discoveries. One of the most prolific, productive ones has been the EGAP, Evaluation of Genomic Applications in Practice and Prevention. So that's a very active arm um, that comes out with you know, studies very regularly. And the goal is to meet the grand challenges in geno genomics. Francis Collins put together this chart in 2003 it talks about what we hope to accomplish in genetic science from a biological standpoint, from a health-related standpoint, and a societal standpoint. So um, just like those originators of the Human Genome Project understood, um, genetics has implications for 
all of these three aspects, the science, the health, and society. So I'm going to teach you a little bit about the clinical and public health applications of genetics today. Um, these are four categories of genetic disorders that we see um, in a clinical setting. One is chromosomal anomalies, so there's an abnormal number or structure of chromosomes. Most people are familiar with Down syndrome, which is an extra chromosome number 21. The next one is single gene disorders, where mutation in one gene causes a known disease. So for example, Tay-Sachs disease is a mutation in one gene that causes that devastating disease. Complex multifactorial disorders, these are polygenic and environmentally influenced diseases, such as diabetes, such as obesity, such as substance abuse, uh, um, which I talked about with Dr. Timberlake before. And then imprinting disorders, which are abnormalities in gene regions that exhibit differential expression based on parental origin of the chromosome. So um, if you have an abnormality in a maternally derived chromosome on a specific gene that undergoes imprinting, um, that's called an imprinting disorder. So how do we evaluate for genetic diseases in a clinical setting? Uh, there are three basic steps. First is to acquire a family history. So you're going to screen for hereditary patterns based on a three-generation pedigree, which you see there. Um, you want to know about the parents' health status, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, you know, as much information as you can get to see if you can determine a, a hereditary pattern. By looking at a pedigree, you can usually see if something is an autosomal recessive, if it's autosomal dominant, or an X-linked disease. And based on that, you can start formulating a differential diagnosis, possible diagnoses. Um, the next step is a personal medical history and a comprehensive physical exam. So if you have suspicion for a particular syndrome, for example, you'll look very carefully for the stigmata of that disease. And finally, um, you can examine the DNA, and that's through lab tests. That requires uh, harvesting DNA through blood, tissue, skin, and now we've developed the ability to obtain DNA through saliva samples, which um, makes things a lot easier. So here's the family um, history again. If you can show uh, the suspected inheritance patterns. And what's really interesting now is how public health has almost entered the clinic exam room. Uh, there's increasing emphasis by the public health community on family history as a determinant of risk for disease. It's helping us stratify risk and helping us guide screening protocols. Um, the National Family History Initiative is a collaboration by the Surgeon General, the National Human Genome Research Institute, the NIH, the CDC, and the AHRQ. Um, it urges all Americans to learn more about diseases that run in their families. And this initiative produced an online tool that allows patients to input their family history and information and share the data with their doctor. Uh, their website is called the My Family Health Portrait site, which we can access. I don't know if I can access it now, but. Um, something else that this initiative has done was um, the Surgeon General declared Thanksgiving Day to be National Family History Day. So knowing that family, families gather together on Thanksgiving, they hope to capitalize on that and use it as a, an opportunity for you to learn about your family health history. I'm not sure if it's appetizing to talk about that over <laughs> turkey, but it's an opportunity. Would you want to access that? I, I'm going to try. Um, I think if you go back to the regular view and hike and just enter after so that it recognizes it as a Yeah, and then enter. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, and then, and then if you go to the regular um, slide view, uh, slide show. <coughs> No, you're an IT department in This is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it miraculously appears. So this is the website. Okay, so you can create your family history in, in Spanish, in Portuguese, in Italian if you want. 
I wonder why only those three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. And they're working on the other languages. <laughs> so we might just put in. Are you in fact registered? <laughs> um, I already know mine, so I don't really need to. Use <laughs> but it's okay. actually great for um, you know for for new patients, for example. So I'm not going to divulge my data for you, <laughs> but um, you can get an idea of how that works, and I'll let you play around with it. <laughs> and there's no linking directly to other family, like they actually have multiple family members enter information. There's no way I don't to connect that, right? There's I not an identifier or anything. That... No. Okay. Unless it's some illicit government. <laughs> 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 So this is just, again, like I said, the physical exam. Um, we glean as much as we can on the physical exam about a potential syndrome that might be going on. A clinical genetics exam is a lot uh, more comprehensive than your standard exam. We start measuring um, you know, eye length, ear length, nose, and looking for anything really out of the ordinary physically. Um, as I mentioned before, genetic testing used to just be in the realm of obstetrics and pediatrics, but we're seeing a lot more applications to medicine, surgery, and other subspecialties. We'll talk about a couple of those. Um, the very first genetic test was the chromosome study, the karyotype, which I mentioned. Um, and what that does is that it shows us missing or extra chromosomes, deleted or duplicated sections of chromosomes, and translocated segments. We use that uh, to diagnose a suspected syndrome or in, in cases of infertility. That's where we use karyotypes most of the time for. Um, the left is your standard karyotype, the right is a very pretty spectral karyotype. That's the karyotype of a patient with Down syndrome. You can say, see at the bottom where it says 21, there are three chromosome type ones. <coughs> the high resolution karyotype was the next step in the evolution of chromosome studies. This offered a much sharper view um, that was able to detect more subtle anomalies in, in the chromosomes. Uh, we used that to evaluate children with developmental delay and physical abnormalities um, when a standard karyotype was negative. But our approaches are continually evolving. The FISH study um, allowed us to look even more precisely at specific areas that were missing deletions in the chromosome material. This uses fluorescent probes to detect the presence or absence of specific chromosome segments, and it's used to confirm, confirm deletions, like I mentioned. Um, comparative genomic hybridization, which I mentioned before, gives us the finest look at the chromosomes we can get. It detects deletions and duplications. It's more detailed than even the high resolution karyotype, and it's beginning to trump the traditional karyotype as an initial test in some cases. So, um, for example, if we have a child with um, autism, and the karyotype looks normal, we're not able to find anything else wrong, we'll go on to the CGH. Um, and printing disorders also have another uh, approach to testing, which I won't get into right now. Sorry, with the comparative one, yes. what, what, uh, what's the normal? I mean, what do you compare to? Um, there's a normal control that has the normal number of you know, copy numbers, duplications and deletions of a specific chromosome region. So if you run the sample and you find that um, there is a chromosome region that is in duplicate, and that seems to be the only abnormality in that genome, we might be able to connect that duplication to the child's phenotype. And we're still trying to determine what the clinical significance of these are. Right. Sometimes you'll get you know, a duplication that really has no bearing and we're still studying. You, you probably will talk about this later, but um, I, I'm always amused by the definition of normal in, right. in a genome study. That's right. Yeah. Of the, 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 the. That's right. I mean, that's a really big part of this. Um, and at the very, very end of the talk, I'm going to talk about, uh, about, a, about a little bit more. I promise. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're looking at closer and closer views of the DNA. We started with the gross chromosomes, now we're moving our way to the single gene disorders and the point mutations. Uh, when we look for specific point mutations, we need to do mutation analysis. 
and we test for a specific change that's associated with specific genetic disease. Um, and this is wh really where we see uh, the correlation between genetics and disease prevention. We utilize these tests not only to diagnose diseases, but also to prevent them. Um, and there's two types of, of prevention. There's genotypic prevention in genetics. That's preventing the transmission of disease from generation to generation. We see that mainly in the realm of obstetrics and preconceptional carrier screening. So if we're looking at a couple from an ethnic group um, that has a high prevalence of a certain disease, we'll offer a specific carrier screening for that, for example. Um, PGD is a fairly new technology. It's called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis um, that we can test uh, in vitro fertilized embryos for genetic anomalies before implanting them. So that's become very uh, useful to high-risk couples, for example, who want to determine the genetics before they move forward with a, an IVF baby. And then finally, <coughs> diagnosis through amniocentesis, chorionic villus sampling, um, looking at what the baby has and if uh, there's an abnormality, a severe abnormality, um, some couples opt to terminate pregnancies. The next type of prevention is phenotypic prevention, so that's preventing the expression or reducing the severity of disease based on the genetic information we have, and that's applicable, applicable to virtually all ages. Just um, out of curiosity, it sounds like PGD is actually in use. Is it being used for sex selection at all? Um, the organizations, the Association of Reproductive Medicine advises against using it for sex selection unless it's for um, risk for an excellent disease, for example. So but is it being used at all? I'm sure it is. Yeah, they do, okay. but it's advised against. So how does PGD work? Um, basically, they they fertilize you know, the, the ovum with the sperm mm -hmm. and create an IVF embryo. And then at the blastomere stage, when the embryo is only about eight cells, they extract one of the cells and they run all sorts of genetic tests on it. So they can do a karyotype, they can do mutation analysis if there's a known disease in the family and see if the baby's affected. Uh, and that has no first uh, taking one out of eight cells? So far, they say the embryo is so undifferentiated at that point that it does not have an effect. But as time goes on, you know, who knows? One eighth of their life gets. One eighth. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, very short. Yeah. One eighth very of their accomplishments. And what? But don't don't they implant more than one embryo? Um, um, it's before implantation. So while it's still in the test tube, they'll check several. Oh, I see. Yeah. So they one take one cell, cell from yeah. each each of the can but, but yeah. candidates. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's how you know which one they implant. Right. So it's actually been um, used when you, by couples, for example, who don't believe in pregnancy termination, who are at very high risk for something, for example, a Jewish couple with Tay-Sachs disease, they don't want a baby like that, they don't believe in abortion, they'll use that technology. Okay. So you're probably familiar with newborn screening. Uh, that's for inborn errors of metabolism. That's probably one of the greatest achievements in public health um, with relation to genetics. Within the past decade, we've had an expansion in newborn screening through tandem mass spectrometry, spectrometry um, that's allowed us to, to screen for multiple um, metabolic disorders. We still only test for about five or six. Um, now we're looking at a multitude of amino acid, organic acid, and fatty acid oxidation disorders. And the role of public health has in this area is to, make, is to make sure that these expanding testing capabilities help rather than harm patients and populations. We need to optimize sensitivity versus specificity. We have to manage false positives. We have to maintain cost effectiveness of the screening. Um, in terms of the false positives, um, by doing all this mass screening, we're coming up with you know, um, results that might not have clinical meaning, which is something you mentioned. Um, and so that's something public health can help monitor. What's the role of public health leaders? In general, in public health genomics, is monitoring scientific evidence on the relationship among genotype, phenotype, and genetic test parameters. It's systematically reviewing the benefits, costs, and risks of genetic testing. It's shaping public policies regarding genetic testing. And this has all been traditionally within the realm of NIH and HGRI. Uh, 
the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Genetics, Health, and Society, CDC, the Office of Public Health Genomics, USPSTF, which is the Preventive Services Task Force, state government. Uh, but this is undergoing some recent re reorganization due to budgetary issues right now. The SACGHS is also retiring um, this year, which is a shame, I think. Um, USPSTF recommendations are basically um, the, uh, the task force review of the literature on, on specific uh, health protocols. In terms of genetics, we look at um, whether or not that genetic test provides benefits that exceed harms, and then you have the grading scale ABCDI. One of um, the few USPSTF recommendations that involve genetic screening involves hemochromatosis. This is one of the first recommendations that came out of that body. Um, hemochromatosis is an inherited iron storage disorder that can damage the liver and other organs. And the USPSTF found only a small number of those who tested positive actually developed clinical disease. There was no evidence of benefits to early treatment, but they did find that testing positive was associated with anxiety, mm -hmm. potential stigmatization, over-treatment in some, so they recommended against routine genetic screening for that disease. Do these, um, this sort of framework for recommendations, does it allow for sort of more focused screening? You know, for example, if, if you were in a family where there's some history of illness, Right. Does this body make any recommendations regarding potential, you know, sort of targeted screening, or is these are these really just focused on routine screening? You're all very prophetic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there so we go. my next slide is on genetic testing for cancer yeah. susceptibility. So the two two of the most common cancers: hereditary breast ovary, colon cancer. Um, what does the USPSCF say about that? Mm -hmm. Exactly what you mentioned. Okay. They recommend against testing people for BRCA, BRCA mutations for those with uh, no family history, a uh, family history that's not suggested for it. But they do recommend in favor of it for those who do have a family history suggested of it. So they absolutely do look at that. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and so we talked about family history, we talked about the physical exam, we talked about um, genetic testing, um, the next step in <coughs> our approach to patients, excuse me, <coughs> is pharmacogenomics and treatment. How does genetics play into therapy for diseases? So this um, cartoon is showing Eureka, it won't cure anything, but the side effects are terrific. And you can see how um, genetics can play a role in preventing adverse effects. <coughs> One common medication used um, is warfarin. It's an anticoagulant drug. It's used in heart patients and those at risk for blood clots. And what's challenging about that is that um, there's great interpersonal variation in response to warfarin. So if you get a too high dose for what your body can handle, um, you'll be susceptible to hemorrhaging. If you don't get enough, you'll suscept you're susceptible to clotting. And we found that there are variants in two genes, CYP2C9 and VCORC1, that have been correlated with differences in warfarin metabolism. So one, um, SNPs in the cytochrome P450 uh, system, which involves drug metabolism, and SNPs in the vitamin K epoxide reductase genes, which involve drug action, have been um, associated with uh, differences in warfarin metabolism. And genetic tests have been developed to help guide dosing. Research is continuing on the impact this, this genetic testing will have on patients. There's a trial um, that they're going to start to prevent DVT, deep venous thrombosis, in elderly patients undergoing orthopedic surgery. These patients tend to be non-ambulatory after surgery and high, at high risk for clots. They're going to um, compare the safety and effectiveness of warfarin dosing strategies based on genetic testing to determine if um, this type of dosing will actually reduce the rate of adverse outcomes. So what is the public health implication? Um, ideally, genetic testing of this kind would improve quality of care. So if you're not getting patients with hemorrhages, if you're not getting patients with blood clots, with pulmonary emboli, which is a, a, a major complication, um, this will not only improve quality of care, but it will promote cost savings to the healthcare system in general. So looking to the future, 
we're getting, uh, with these more and more detailed pictures we're getting of the genome, um, the pressure really is on the genetics community to be able to tailor medical treatment to the individual characteristics of each patient. The ability to classify individuals into subpopulations that differ in susceptibility to disease and response to particular treatment is something we're aiming for. And we'd like to also be able to um, concentrate preventive and therapeutic interventions on those who will benefit from them and spare that expense of side effects for those who will not. Excuse me, but well, are you suggesting that they, uh, they're going to use genetic tests to set dose with warfarin rather than the traditional measuring uh, clotting time on a regular basis? Um, right now that's what they do. They check INRs mm -hmm. and they regulate and they see. Um, now they're going to probably use them both in combination. Start off with the genetic test so that you know where to start with those at the safest level and then monitor based on the INR together. So do you think ultimately it would be the genetic test and not monitoring? I think you would need the monitoring anyway. But I think the genetic so test what would helps be the savings? So why do we care? <laughs> because when instead of experimenting on a patient and, and risking that risking that complication, we're starting off on, in a better place. I'm thinking also because the CP450 can influence by phytochemicals. Mm -hmm. So I think this can be a good idea. <laughs> yes. So because, you know, what I can hear from the patients, uh, if they are on the warfarin, it's forbidden to them to eat fruits, vegetables, and so on. With this one, I think it can be an advantage because we can monitor that. We can add them to phytochemicals and monitor that in this way because the phytochemicals can influence the CP450. I don't know what is the time when right. I do so that. But it would be interesting to look at yeah. gene-environment interactions mm -hmm. of that kind mm -hmm. as well. So the cost savings wouldn't be in terms of testing a blood, the blood test for the INR. It would be more in terms of preventing the complication from the beginning. Okay. So the future of genetics is presumed to be in whole genome sequencing. and. Um, we're already you know, kind of on top of that and trying to predict what this might mean in the future. There's going to be uh, a workshop from the Institute of Medicine this July looking at um, integrating large-scale genomic information into clinical practice. Right now, whole genome sequencing is projected to cost anywhere from $6,000 to $20,000 I've seen. And it's projected to fall to $1,000 and become more commonly utilized. And we're already starting to uh, look at what the challenges of that might be. The storage of genetic information, access to genetic information, portability of this increased genomic data. Physicians have to become more facile in interpreting and communicating genomic data. Um, but there are a lot more challenges um, in terms of uh, how to apply this into clinical practice. We're going to get a lot of information about the genome. We're going to see quote unquote abnormalities that we weren't expecting. What do those abnormalities mean? Do they have any clinical significance? Do we report them to patients? Do we not? You know, at what point do we decide to release that information? These are all things that we'll be working on um, in the next few years. So some ELSI issues, ethical, legal, and social implications that arise from the collection of genetic information. Um, it's all related. It, it can be related to mass genetic databases. There are threats to privacy. This became an issue for the first time when newborn screening data began being collected. Um, there's potential for genetic discrimination and in health insurance and employment. And there are actually historical examples of that ha that have happened over the past several decades. Uh, back in the 1970s, um, one classic example is um, discrimination that occurred against um, African Americans who were carriers for sickle cell anemia. So they were clinically asymptomatic. They were just determined to have um, one copy of the sickle cell mutation, um, and they were discriminated against in employment, educational, and insurance settings. And we found that misconceptions about genetic data had adverse social consequences. So this is something that's really um, still on our minds. With this explosion of genetic information and finding out if, oh, you have some quote-unquote abnormality in your genome, is that going to cause, is that going to wreak havoc in, in our society? Um, there was a famous lawsuit regarding genetic discrimination. Um, the first EEOC lawsuit 
regarding that was against uh, the Burlington Santa Fe Railroad. The railroad screened its employees for a rare genetic condition associated with carpal tunnel syndrome, which would apparently affect their performance. They did not obtain informed consent, and not only was that an ethical problem, but they felt that um, genetic determinism should not play a role in hiring and retention decisions. There's another case of insurance discrimination, a little boy with fragile X syndrome, which is a hereditary form of developmental delay. He was denied health insurance because um, they felt that since fragile X was genetic, he was born with it, it was therefore a pre-existing condition, and therefore he was ineligible for coverage. That was a sad <coughs> case. So all of these historical events um, prompted legislation. And Along the way, we developed partial protections against these different forms of gender discrimination. One was Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Rehab Act of 73, the ADA of 1990, all the way down um, to um, the HIPAA mandate of 2002, along with state anti-discrimination laws. But each of these had loopholes. So over the past uh, two decades, we've been working very hard on passing the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which is affectionately known as GINA, and that was actually passed in 2008. It was first proposed in 1995, so it took about 13 years. It went through several iterations um, until it was signed into law. And it basically bars insurance companies from denying healthy individuals coverage or charging them higher premiums based on genetic information and it prevents employers from using genetic information in hiring, firing, or promoting employees. But GINA, too, is not perfect, um, so we have to remain vigilant. So how do we prepare the public health workforce to deal with all of these issues? Um, we need to stay abreast of not just the science, but the impact on health and the impact on society. And for that reason, the Institute of Medicine, CDC, and the American Association of Schools of Public Health have recommended um, achieving competency in genomics because it really is relevant to all aspects of public health. And that's a list of some of the competencies the CDC recommends. Um, the ability to demonstrate basic knowledge about genomics and the development of, the disease, of disease. The ability to identify limits in, in genomic expertise and knowing when to refer to those with greater expertise in genomics. That's what prompted me to write my book. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions? So, um, the insurance question is interesting because I don't know how much uh, insurance now pays for genetic testing, I think beyond the pregnancy outcome. Right. But at the same time, most people want to shield their information from the insurance companies because of the right. but the pre-existing condition clause may no longer be relevant because of the healthcare reform so ideally, uh, ideally <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen but can you talk a little bit more about about what you've seen in terms of um, who actually goes through with the testing whether or not that has uh, the insurance company has influence on that, whether or not they have coverage, and what we should expect in terms of insurance companies, companies having access to broad population. Type. Yeah, that's definitely a concern. Yeah. Um, pre gina when I was a fellow, um, I remember patients would come and say they want to have their testing done under a pseudonym. Mm -hmm. They didn't want it covered through insurance. They paid out of pocket. Um, post gina I think people have been a little bit more um, amenable to having it covered by their insurance. Um, I've seen patients do that. Um, for those who want to pay out of pocket, the genetic testing companies themselves are pretty good about giving discounts to patients. So there are ways of kind of, you know, manipulating the environment to get the testing done for patients who really need it and really want it. Um, in terms of what will happen in the future, um, Right now, there's a big push in, in, in electronic medical record systems, and doctors are being paid incentives to turn everything electronic. So as more information gets into computer systems, we have to start worrying about you know, privacy issues and who's going to hack into these databases and 
um, it's going to become a, a, a challenging environment in terms of protecting, protecting genetic information. There's a big discrepancy um, for some diseases between the heritability that we get from family and twin studies and the actual number of identified genes that could account for this. And one of the classic examples is ADHD, where twin study after twin studies have indicated that it's one of the most heritable diseases, about 80%. And so even if you were to take the um, individual um, polymorphisms or genetic variants published in various studies and add them, take an additive effect, which we know these genes don't necessarily have. We don't even come close to that 80%. And so there's really a big question as whether or not we haven't identified these variants. Um, and I, I was just wondering if you could maybe comment on the current state of the HapMap project and maybe some of these other areas that we're now getting into to account for this huge discrepancy between what we're seeing from the family studies. We used to always think that there was one gene, one protein, one disease. Yeah, you know? right. But now we're starting to see that there are multifactorial disorders, you know, uh, polygenic environmental mm -hmm. gene environment interactions. Epigenetics, I think, will probably start giving some more insight into disorders like ADHD. There, there might be a, a component there. Um, copy number variations as well. That's something you wouldn't see necessarily on a GWAS study that you might see on a CGH, for example. Um, so I think that the more capabilities we have of examining the genome and looking for alterations that might associate with disease, we might gain more insight. It's not so possible that the twin studies overestimate the heritability. Well, that's think about yeah. The, I mean, the fact that the twins, for example, have a shared yeah. prenatal environment. Right. And one of the big hot areas of research in environmental health now is sort of influence of prenatal environment on health. Yeah, and that wouldn't necessarily be right. You know, genetic polymorphism. They, well, it could, it's a problem could be with yeah. the heritability studies, and that's certainly um, mm -hmm. one of the big questions is whether um, we can make this basic assumption, which is called the equal environment assumption, which gets at the, the idea that the, the MCs are going to be essentially sharing the same sort of. Mm -hmm. Environment. Now they've they've done a lot of sort of studies um, across the board to suggest that for the most part that assumption can be made. Um, but prenatally, I don't you know I haven't seen any sort of anything addressed at that level. And these studies are, are pretty rudimentary. You know, a lot of the sort of family twin based designs because they really are are based on these fundamental assumptions most of the times, which we don't even assess. So so that could very well be the case that we're just overestimating. Yeah, I'm just. Oh, yeah, I'm just thinking like, uh, especially like with the diagnosis and detection, you know, for the colon cancer or for the breast cancer, uh, is it routinely done? Then, if the people will go through this diagnostic process to have like consultations, you know, like lifestyle modification, type of the eating and everything, because eventually they don't need to wait; they can start to modify and change that. Uh, was it's it's part of the clinical encounter. Is they're it? they're found to have that. Um, well, I mean, in, in the breast cancer, for example, they're offered prophylactic surgery. It's not, it's a lot more complicated, I think. But the nutrition obviously is important as well. And um, as a preventive medicine yeah. specialist, too, I totally mm -hmm. understand. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I'm thinking, like, I mean, if the people will learn about this, and so I think there were some studies showing that uh, if there was no problem from the family, so they were just continuing. Uh, unhealthy, you know, lifestyle modification. They've actually, uh, yeah. yeah, they've actually done studies to mm -hmm. see if genetic information mm -hmm. is will like, stimulate yeah. better behavior mm -hmm. or behavior than mm -hmm. it does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a very powerful, mm -hmm. you know, motivator for people yeah. to change yeah. their lifestyle. So we should use that. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Well, thank you for bringing in the competencies that CDC and ASPH, um, and you've taught this to multiple audiences from different backgrounds. And what part of it do you think is most challenging for those who are not trained in? Um, I think the genetics. hardest part is usually the molecular genetics. So I try to be as basic as I can in that area, um, just teach them the core of what they need to understand how genetics works. Yeah. Uh, you talked a lot about um, sort of herit heritable uh, conditions. Uh, to, to what extent has public health genetics had anything to say about susceptibility to pathogens? Okay, mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. Um, 
susceptibility to infectious diseases, for example, HIV, we found that a certain polymorphism can be protective against HIV. So we are looking at gene environment interactions, the environment being an infectious organism. Um, we're also looking at microbial genomics, looking at um, the genome of, uh, of, a, of a bacteria or a virus to see how we can find weaknesses in that organism so we can develop therapies against it. There are applications to bioterrorism preparedness, for example. So there is a whole field of you know, infectious disease and communicable disease control growing out of genomics as well. That's fascinating. I mean, your interest in tuberculosis, I've always wondered about how can we have so large population of carriers and not many active. Not just TB, MRSA. Yeah, yeah, there are lots of them, but yeah. I, I just, I mean, I, I don't, I didn't, I don't see much about the, the susceptibility at the genetic level for those things. It's almost always socioeconomic, diet, poor conditions. You know. it's, it's very fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you.